there were certain things that we wanted to demonstrate in the ATF. One was what's called super cruise, the ability to fly the airplane at supersonic speeds without using an afterburner. Super maneuverability that was at least equal to and hopefully greater than the existing F-15, F-16 air, and advanced avionics that allowed uh, you to see but not be seen. And uh, so those, those were the things that were to be demonstrated. And the shape of the airplane is optimized for stealth, optimized for performance. Uh, the avionics part of it, we talked about that earlier, about the digital influence. The avionics portions are as cosmic as the airplane is, uh, and they were tested on a flying test bed airplane. And both companies, Lockheed and Northrop, had their own flying test bed airplane. So, but the airplane was easy to fly. It was it was just uh, almost mindless, mind numbing how easily it flew uh, from landing to takeoff. Uh, formation flying was just a delight. Air refueling was a delight. I could. It's the only airplane I could take my hands off the throttle and sit on the tanker. Yeah. And I could relax the grip on the hand grip and it would just sit there. I never got to the point where I took my hand completely off, but it was a beautiful, beautiful flying airplane. And uh, again, the credit goes to the engineers, but it also goes to the fact that we have the computer power to simulate that and make corrections before we ever fly to the flight control system. Paul, I've got a thousand questions. I, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to get through this next bit, but so, so the first question I would, I would ask then is this, you talk about the handling qualities. You earlier said it was inherently stable. You know, it's, I think it's probably fairly well known things like the F-16 are inherently unstable. What are those two things and why do they matter? Let me, let me make it clear. It is an unstable airframe. But as you change your angle of attack, as the center of pressure shifts because of the aerodynamics, you have to, you want to, and Northrop has kind of patented this approach in their aerodynamic science, you want the airplane to naturally recover itself. So as the, the aerodynamics are such that as you go to these high angles of attack, which normally would result in departures uh, in an unstable airplane, you want to be able to naturally, the airplane naturally wants to pitch back down out of the condition. So at high angle attack, it acts, it acts as a stable airplane, i.e. pitching out of the condition, not departing from the condition. Right. At normal flight angles of attack, it is an unstable airframe. So the I would I would so in my mind then I'm thinking, well, if you've got computers that are handling all the flight controls and stuff, does it really matter if it doesn't want to sort of come back out of that high angle of attack condition in, in a sort of calm way? Well, that's that's a design philosophy. Uh, Northrop has always, with the F5 family of airplanes, always assure themselves that no matter what happens, including flight control failures, that the airplane will on its own recover. The F-22 is a wonderful airplane example. I, literally, our emergency procedure for out of control is remove your hands and feet from the rudder pedals and hands from the stick and let the airplane take care of it. It'll sort it out every time. Uh, and uh, you, you can do you can do a lot with digital flight controls, and that takes special design qualities in the, in the aerodynamic area. You mentioned as well then the, the avionics and um, the, the test bed. Uh, it's a surprise to me actually to learn that that was sort of part of the, um, and maybe I, I should have done some reading, I should have read your book before we had this conversation, but it's a surprise to learn that was part of the, the competition. I always sort of assumed that you know, the low observability and the aerodynamic qualities of the aeroplane were one thing, but then just like the engines, the avionics would be maybe a different thing. The Air Force might buy a platform and then integrate um, avionics into it, but it, it had selected separately. Uh, but, but were you therefore working on common avionics with the same guys, with you know the, the same avionics as the F-20, YF-22 team, or were you building your own avionics capabilities? No, both companies built their own avionics systems. And uh, I, I got involved in a lot of the simulations uh, to determine what, what is the effect of each one of the sensors. Is, it, is the sensor by its way onto the airplane? Is a sensor worth putting on the airplane from a weight and cost point of view? So how far away should your radar detect another airplane? And uh, how many missiles do you carry and how do you effectively use it? So we get in, as pilots, we get involved in that aspect of the design. We've touched on computing power a lot. In, in this conversation, relatively speaking. And one of the questions I'd asked you earlier was whether or not sort of test pilots, as you, as you were going through the, your experience as a test pilot, you were seeing sort of test pilots become more uh, sort of managers of computer systems and of, of avionics and that kind of stuff. But at that point in time, were you doing things like sensor fusion? Were you trying to simplify the job of the pilot to figure out what was in front of him or her or, or how to protect himself or, or how to go and kill the bad guy? Uh, or were you still sort of in the, the 90s sort of frame of mind where 
uh, you know, you've got a radar warning receiver, you've got a, a radar, you've got a radio, you've got ESM, whatever. Oh, that, that was one of the first and foremost design criteria. It was what we call carefree abandon. The airplane must be able to take care of itself. The pilot can do whatever he wants to do with the stick and throttle, and he cannot damage or hurt the airplane in any way for the equipment. So that's part of carefree abandon. In the cockpit side, very strictly disciplined to provide you, the pilot, a picture of the situation around your airplane without knowing whether you need it, whether you're seeing it on the radar warning receiver or on the radar or a sensor, another sensor. We had what was called sensor fusion. You have sensors on the airplane that can see out around the airplane. And what you do is you take that information in from multiple sensors and put them into a single solution. There are two airplanes at your right two o'clock position, 47 miles X number of speed. That reduces the pilot to a tactician, not a systems operator. And that's very important when you're traveling at these high speeds and closing quickly on the enemy. And so, uh, yeah, that, that was a uh, big push, which to use the avionics to simplify the pilot task. If I, I mean, I, I, again, it's not something I, I know much about as is evident in this conversation, but I remember sort of some pictures of the YR-23 cockpit. It looked like you, you had a uh, heads up display from an F-15E and, and maybe some um, MFDs from something like an F-15 or, or an F-18, something like that. Um, were you doing things as granular as playing as a new personally as playing with color and playing with shapes to represent those things on on a display well first of all the prototypes had no bore no resemblance to the production cockpit they did just in fact it had a digital engine displays and that had just digital displays but they were taken right off of f-15 and f-18 just as you said so there was no attempt, uh, there was no radar, there were no sensors on the prototype airplanes. That's where we explored it in the flying test bed for all those things. We had, uh, we had a pilot's group, uh, non-test pilots, but pilot's group did the yeoman work in coming up with the displays and colors and enemy aircraft indicate the details of the, of the actual display were done by a group of pilots in pilot vehicle interface, PVI was the organization. So, so when did you first fly it? Flight one, August 27th, 1990. And how was it? So, you, I mean, you've talked a lot about simulation. So did you, you knew what sort of speed it would unstick at? You knew what sort of speed, you know, it would take flight at? How, how close to the simulation was it? Well, it was right on the money. In fact, uh, I, I get a kick out of uh, thinking back on it. We, we did the simulator. I must've done a thousand landings or more in the simulator, testing the flight controls for what was called power approach or the landing configuration. And the, the computers were not all as we have today, but they were not bad. It had a visual of Edwards Air Force Base and the final approach into Edwards Air Force Base and fly that, fly it, and fly it, and fly it just many, many times. So the, the day of the first flight, I go fly and the airplane behaves just like it does. And it's time to land. I come back on landing and I have this funny feeling of deja vu on the final approach here. I said, I've been here. I've been here a thousand times because it, it operated exactly like the simulator. No surprise. Are, are there parts then of the envelope that are, are easier to simulate than that? I mean, you talked about, uh, I think, did you call it laminar flows or, or some kind of flows that are difficult to, high angle of attack flight is difficult to simulate. So, so as you progress through envelope expansion, did you start to find a, a sort of divergence between what was in the sim and what was in the real airplane? No, we didn't. The, the, the problem with the prototype program for both companies, you only had about 90 days to, to do it. And uh, we had very few flights. So the emphasis was on getting out to super cruise conditions so we could prove that it could super cruise. And that meant foregoing a lot of the detailed testing we would do at the lower and mid altitudes for a normal test program. So we, we I call it tunneling, we kind of tunneled out a portion of the flight envelope that got us up to 35, 40,000 feet where we could do some super cruise testing. And uh, we didn't go uh, down low altitude at high speed, high, high dynamic pressure, but we did go out to, uh, well, we didn't, we did intend, here's another point. We intentionally did not go to Mach 2.0, not because it wouldn't go there. In fact, the number two airplane with a G engine could go quite a bit faster than that. Uh, it was just an engineering decision not to uh, go to Mach 2, but we didn't, we didn't go to the more risky areas, which are high dynamic pressure, low altitude, and we didn't go to the high angle attack, which I've already mentioned over on the left-hand side of the applied envelope. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10 hit subscribe, 
and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.